But this is our last session. Sorry to say. Um, it's been a lot of fun, but Charlie's come back. For, for you guys, I think, have seen Charlie because you all took the other class, but he's come back to um, contribute to our restaurant discussion because he has a lot of experience with that. So tonight we're going to lead off by um, doing a few slides on restaurants, and then we will um, open it up to questions, as always. And uh, one of the things I'm just going to mention is if you have questions about your business plan or any other questions that are off this topic, we're happy to take them tonight since it's the last night. So let's start with food. Why have food? So we we put these slides together with what we think are the key points, but I'm going to let Charlie respond to the food items. Sure. Uh, I know that when I started uh, my first brewery, I decided there was no way I could handle doing food because I was too busy doing the brewery. Um, but with the second one, we, we really felt that food was going to be uh, a critical part of what we were doing, largely because we wanted that uh, uh, the, the food really helps, I think, kind of to establish the business as being an open and going concern. You know, when you have just a brewery, you, the tendency is to have a tasting room that's open here and there, um, and sometimes just a limited number of days, limited number of hours. Um, so as we said here, beer sales, why have food? I, I think with that question that, that uh, uh, for whatever you're doing in-house, you will do more of it if you have food. Uh, extended hours, you know, it's hard to get people in for unless you have food, um, and that, you know, is going to add to more sales. Um, and if we look at the typical yeah. tasting room, they're only open three or four nights a week, and sometimes they're only open for four hours. Yeah. So you, you might say to yourself, well, that's okay, that's great, but why? I mean, why, why should I? I don't have to be big. I don't have to do this. And that's true. You don't. But there is a certain uh, big upside to it um, in that you're – you're never going to make, a. You're never going to make more money than the beer that you sell over your own bar, um, and that's uh, where where Melly wrote down here third-party distribution. I think that it, it's critical to realize that because if you're your bar, you're be doing Mic. We'll try this. Can you guys hear better now? Because this is kind of a big fat mic. If I talk like this, can you hear me better? Because I think it might be canceling out. Hello. That is not helping. There's Corey. Oh, that's better? That's better? Okay. I don't think you need to hold it up. I have to have this for your audio blip. Okay. Okay. Okay, so is it better for me to hold it up a closer? I would imagine it would be. We usually don't have to do that. No? no. So you think it was just a network thing? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let us know if we need to change tack again here. So, um, no, it's the same. Okay. So, um, the, where was I? So with the, that money that you have your own pub, the, if you take a look around, you see, we found this out particularly in the 90s when there was a slowdown in the market. There's a lot of breweries that closed, and the vast majority of them were production breweries. If you had a restaurant, it kind of equalized things. And there's also this, 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 this pocket of money that people don't quite understand. If you're paying your distributor $80, $90 a barrel to distribute the beer, and so is everybody else, if you don't have to pay that money, and let's say you do 1,000 barrels a year in your pub, that's eighty to $90,000 uh, 
that you're making that is literally just going in your pocket. And it could, it'll take you, you know, do the math, it'll take you a lot of sales on the street to get that much profit that literally is giving you this money that's coming to you uh, because you don't have to pay a distributor like everybody else or you don't have to drive it anywhere. And uh, I know in my case it was money, it was money we appreciated. It was also, um, it, it encouraged us to be more price competitive than the guy down the street because we knew we were made, had a better margin. So we, you know, for the same product that we were selling to someone else, we were actually cheaper than everybody in town for our beer. And that's, you know, for people that are regular customers in particular, that can be an enormous advantage. So the brew pub thing has a lot of advantages to it that are built in. Um, what do we have for our next slide, man? The, uh, the the one thing I will say, are we gonna I forget, are we getting to the downsides later? You can talk about downsides. Too. Well, the big I mean, the biggest downside, the only one I can really think about, think of for me, is that it is its own. It's another business, and sometimes, it, like I said, it can be very overwhelming to think about not only trying to find the space to do it, but the actual operations of, okay, now I'm running a whole other business on top of it. Um, and the food site can actually lose you a lot of money unless you know what you're doing. you got to know what you're doing. But I will say that it, your, your odds of success are way better than your average restaurant just because people like brew pubs. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it. People appreciate this, the uniqueness of the brew pub of a place that makes a product and sells it over their own bar. And uh, it's hard to underestimate that. Other things that I would say on that side in terms of compelling arguments for it, one of the biggest is marketing. Is that it's a that the brew pub? I always consider our pub to be our best marketing. And the pub helped sell sell beer wholesale, and the wholesale beer helped sell beer in the pub. And so there's a certain synergy to be able to having that control and that exposure. From a brewing perspective, if you have, if you know you're going to have a captive audience of customers, you're probably going to be feel a lot better about taking risks with trying new things and just maybe flying a trial balloon in your pub. It provides you an avenue to do that that even a tasting room of the small scale might not provide you with. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a guy who kind of has embraced that whole thing, and it was a little bit of a stretch because I didn't really have a lot of restaurant experience, but I can't really imagine doing it any other way at this point especially where we are here because it's so, such passion for it. So um, let's move on, though, to what Mel and I uh, talked about earlier today, which was, okay, so let's say you decide to do this. It's important to understand that it is a little complicated because you essentially become start running two somewhat different businesses that are, that are actually kind of trading or selling each other product and are sharing overhead and running them on one set of books, typically. So, um, Melly, do you want to hop in on this piece here? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been talking a little bit about the fact that a lot of people use QuickBooks, and it's really set up to handle one entity. So now you've actually got two separate entities, and what I've shown you in lectures is kind of, we spent a lot of time looking at the production side and selling different craft beverages out of the production side. Well, now we're adding a whole other business unit where we have to figure out how we're allocating profits and expenses to the to both sides and this first slide is kind of showing you like well what clearly is separate um, you know you've got the restaurant side where you know that the food is a cost and the food brings in its own profits and you've got labor associated with running the restaurant you've got bartenders and people in the in the kitchen and you've got a general manager things like that and you've got supplies all related to the restaurant different equipment, different taxes. And on the brewery side, we've covered a lot of this in class, like all those things to do with production. So it's clear that we can separate the profits and the costs related along these lines. Cost of goods sold is pretty easy to split. So that's not the problem. So let's get into where we're going to see challenges. So the tougher the tougher things are when you're when you're doing books and it's really not about like keeping your books and getting bills paid and paying taxes and, and kind of the big picture. It's really more about managing the different departments under one set of books and the crossover that you have of sharing the same facility and sharing uh, the same staff for things that are not cost of goods. 
and for uh, essentially selling yourself product. Uh, it's it can be there's no really one answer that I that I know and the problem with QuickBooks is QuickBooks makes it very difficult for you to actually set up departments like business like to have essentially run two businesses in one set of books it's it's a big challenge um, so the overlap areas that I'm talking about uh, overhead obviously what does that mean okay you you have a you have a facility almost always the same facility uh, how do you allocate what rent goes towards the pub and what goes towards the space. It might not be as simple as square footage. Um, you know, it might not even be that those spaces you're renting are actually being charged the same amount. If that's the case, maybe that's an easy way to do it. Okay, I'm paying a buck a foot in the back and I'm paying two bucks a foot in the front. That might be the easiest way to do it. Marketing sales is a, one that should seem kind of simple, like, oh, I'm advertising the pub, I'm advertising the wholesale. But they're, they're interrelated and like I said they kind of support each other anyway and so if I'm doing a marketing effort in Portland versus in Hood River for instance like I was doing it got kind of messy and then if I'm doing a print ad am I advertising the pub or the wholesale or both probably I'm probably focusing on one and benefiting both uh, sales staff is maybe a little bit easier if you have somebody who's selling your beer you might allocate it there. The other thing I would say too here is that I know for me, and we'll, we'll get to it kind of with management, but um, you start kind of to really do analysis this way, you need to kind of take, sometimes it's not so clear like his salary, her salary goes over here. It might be that half of her salary goes here and half of it goes there. You might, I mean, for my, myself, I know that when we did books, I would book, um, I would book half my salary in marketing and sales and half of it in G&A. And then I really didn't know how to put that into how I would split it out for the, the wholesale versus the retail. And we just kind of ended up punting and cutting it in half. So this is what we're talking about. There's oftentimes these overlaps that are not very clear. Administration and doing the books, you know, a lot of times you'll see people just kind of cut, just split it down the middle or however the dollars are. Management, like I said, you know, if you're managing all of this stuff, how do you allocate that to kind of do it? And uh, insurance is another, just one example of something that you tend to get a package price on, and they're not saying, well, I, you know, 20% is for here and 80% is for here. Mm -hmm. um, so you add it all up, and you have a, all this stuff that's below the cost of goods tends to be kind of in play when if you're trying to split, if, you, if you're trying to analyze your, your performance, on both sides of the fence, um, it can be a little tricky. And this, quite frankly, this stuff you can make decisions on. There's the one big one is the cost of the beer. You know, if you're charging the pub retail price for the beer, is that right? I mean, you're all making it here, but if you're charging them cost of goods, then it's going to make the it's going to make the brewery look like it's giving their product away, uh, and it's going to make the public super profitable. So. You need to find a, you need to come up with a rationalization for how you're going to do it, whether you're going to separate these businesses entirely um, or what the handoff is going to be. So what, why don't you tell them what you decided to do with your Yeah, well, we did, what we decided was that, that we would, um, that we didn't want to charge the pub, we didn't want to pub, hold the pub to retail because we didn't want to charge them what everybody else was paying for our beer because we were making decisions that weren't on the pub staff's behalf about the price and stuff like that. We were, we were like, a, we were taking advantage of the fact that we were essentially getting beer cheaper than the same bar owner down the street would be buying our beer, and we were using that, and that that had different consequences. We were typically trying to charge 25 or 50 cents a pint less than the competition, and we saw that is a real great competitive advantage that we could take because of the fact that we weren't paying the distributor. So uh, so in that case, what we, we ended up, we also didn't want to sell it to them at the cost of the brewery because then it would make the brewery side look kind of crappy. It would make the pub side look artificially awesome. And you know, you start, when you're, you're trying to manage people on these things, you, you really want to kind of hold them, you want to be in a spot where they can leave, but it's not like they're getting a big fat head. Like if, if, if I'm a manager and you're saying, okay, well, last month we were 25% profit and now I want you to be 28 
Or if we're 30 and I want you to be 35, they're like, well, God, you're a greedy bastard. But the truth is that that it's all those numbers are all, you know, it could be just the opposite. It could be that I'm I'm saying, no, you're buying beer at retail and I want you to charge less for it. So all of a sudden, he's kind of bouncing along trying to make a few percent profit, but it's all just kind of a construct. So the we, we split the difference. We ended up saying, okay, we'll sell the beer to the pub for the same price that we sell it to the distributor. So you're getting a deal, but it's not a cost. And uh, that still was pretty fat for the pub, for the pub manager and trying to gauge his performance, but you got to pick a lane. You have to be, have something that you can go to and that, that's consistent so that you can compare this month to next month to next year to down the road. So that's what we did. And what about utilities? Um, I mean, yeah, sometimes separate like, metering, but very few, don't. though, right? Yeah. And uh, typically, you'll be paying one gas bill, one water bill. Um, utilities, at the end of the day, aren't a lot, but I mean, the brewery uses a lot of water, but the brewery doesn't necessarily use a lot of HVAC. Mm -hmm. Typically, breweries are not HVAC, so it kind of all evens out. Um, the um, as water is getting more expensive, stuff like, I and mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here. There are some. There's some uh, things you could just have to kind of be aware of. And then, like a lot of things in this business, you just have to make a decision and, and pick a lane and say, this is how we're going to treat it, and use it more as a comparison tool to say, how is our performance versus this time last year versus whatever, and kind of use it more as tracking. Okay, so you didn't separate your utilities out between the two entities. We did. Well, well, what we did, I mean, the biggest thing that we did was we dumped all of our QuickBooks numbers into an Excel spreadsheet, a database, so that we could create we could create essentially two pro, two uh, income statements, mm -hmm. and then we compared. And so we have we have ben, we have benchmarks based off of that. And um, you know, as time went on, as we got bigger, our the GNA and the the utilities piece of it all became smaller relative to the whole, mm -hmm. but it really was more about having a system, some kind of system to deal with this kind of complex thing of, of having shared shared resources, shared expenses, and then having beer going over the fence. Mm -hmm. Lesson being, you just need you need to figure something out because the most important thing is just being able to gauge your how you're doing, and if you're improving. So I've given you all two different spreadsheets for doing your um, profit and loss so that if you choose to do it that way you have two spreadsheets but it, you know as we say it's, it's complicated and there's we have a whole like four-week class on accounting and finance so they, they might have their opinions oh yeah so now let's look at menu development because that's something that um, I've spent a lot of time on teams um, we had one place I work we had four celebrity chefs come through and do menu development the place only lasted a few years because they threw a lot of money into things like that but let's hear about your experience sure about um, what you think you know we have the tried and true well the way that Melly and I do this is we talk on the phone and say what did you do what did you do what have you seen what do you know and and kind of compare notes and just try and give you um, a well-rounded view of these things that what I always come back to is that one of the beautiful things about this business is it's such a um, it's such a cornerstone type of business in society really that making something like beer there are a lot of different ways to figure this out there's a lot of right answers and there's there's not a ton of wrong answers um, having said that you know we're in a certain position here in the way you know the, where we are and coming up on 2014 and I think that has a certain, we have a certain history here in the last 30 years of, of American craft brewing, and we, we can see that things are never going to be the same. They're always going to move around. So in terms of what's tried and true, I think we all know exactly what that is. It's burgers, it's fries, it's pizza, it's fish and chips, it's pub food, uh, mostly of the uh, the British persuasion. <laughs> um, it's simple, it's easy to do, it doesn't take a ton of skill. It tends to be uh, pretty good food costs, and it's um, it's generally quite popular in any setting. So, uh, and it really doesn't go out of style. So, uh, in a lot of ways, it's very hard to argue against that dominant paradigm in any way because you uh, 
people, it's so it's predictable and bankable, and you do it well, it makes a lot of sense. Um, every burgers or burgers, fries, and pizza are the three most popular food items in the world right now. So <laughs> you know, there's that True. too. Um, what we've mentioned here, though, is okay. What's happening now, and what are the opportunities? What are the things we're seeing? And uh, some of them have to do with the fact that there's so many small breweries and places that are just being a little more niche, and that's kind of creating some niche food approaches. Um, I think the outsourced food thing is starting to see more and more and more. Um, I, I think you're seeing part of that is that, you know, as I said, the, the, the real challenge with the restaurant thing is whole other business, whole other piece of work. Um, hey, you have someone show up with some food and that brings people to your door to buy beer, sounds great. Uh, and a lot of times it is great. There's um, several uh, situations like that here, and not just breweries, but pubs. Uh, I was recently in Minneapolis, and that was seemed to be something that was uh, catching on there. A couple, I know a brewery down in San Diego. There's several of those that have kind of banked on that. One has sushi cart that comes, by the way, That's cool. which is huge, huge and popular. One of the issues there is certainly reliability. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned. Yeah, that. I think I mentioned yeah. it in the lecture. Uh, food trucks, you have to have a relationship with them that you're sure they're going to show up, and uh, if they don't show up, it can really affect your sales. So I think I pointed out in the lecture that you know you really don't want to lose that. And if you if you don't own this food truck, you have to have something in place that ensures they're going to show up all the time. Obviously, some of them have incentive. If you look at places like Base Camp. Those food trucks are pretty permanently there outside of the public. Right. Yeah, some food trucks are kind of a misnomer sometimes. And sometimes they're yeah. just like portable. Sometimes they're portable and sometimes they're not, mostly not. Mm -hmm. um, but even the ones that are not portable, that this is kind of seems to be like part of the drill is that, ah, uh, I can't make it today. Yeah. Sorry. One sure. and done. If the one guy doesn't show up, you're done. So. I guess for me, the biggest thing is that, that relying on somebody else for that, it could be really fun. It can be dynamic, too. You bring in different people. It's pretty cool. But you're not making that cash, either. Um, well, here's a good question. What type of incentives do people give the food trucks? Typically, zero. Yeah. Basically, it's just you show up, and there'll be people here, and you'll bring people here, and we'll all benefit. It's a good deal for the food trucks, I think, unless they find something like a festival's going on somewhere that they'd rather be there, then you're kind of in bad shape. But normally, God, it would suck to just have a guy not be able to rely on whoever it was and have them affect your bottom line. That would be tough. And, and then, you know, outsourcing anything, unless you get a really good deal, just means that the job's getting done and you're not making any money off of it. So you got to think that. And then I think the other thing about it, too, for me is that that uh, having the food with the beer is just another just another chance to for you to show your individuality and make your own statement and create something. And uh, I think that, that that's um, that's really at the core of why people like what we do is because it's creative and we're creating it. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I, I have a hard time uh, as a person that likes to create and control their concept to have to rely on somebody else, even if I know them well to do that and then to have it be their branding. So maybe there's maybe there's a dilution issue there too. I um but having said that, I think that people typically people that eat while they're drinking drink more and stay longer. Um so having something is good. We used to joke about it, we call it the the uh uh the oyster crackers on the bar uh scenario. When we were opening our place at Double Mountain we, we were kind of late in figuring out what we were going to do for food, and then we just kind of, that was our joke, that we would have popcorn and oyster crackers um, on the bar, and that, that, that would get us by. But the more we, we said that, and it just started to get less and less funny. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, no, we don't want to be that guy. So uh, running your own food truck, that's a, I mean, that's a really interesting idea. I think you're starting to see a lot of uh, – creative solutions that way in the urban environment. Um, one of the kind of neat trends right now is that, okay, I can't afford to build a kitchen. I buy a, um, there's guys that are retrofitting shipping containers and parking them out there. That's kind of a bigger version of a truck. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think all that stuff 
is just super uh, in play that way. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't. Yeah. I know Dogfish Head is starting their own in, but um, I didn't realize they were starting their own food truck. That's interesting. David, where is that? Because I know that they, I mean, they started as a brew pub. So is that they have a satellite bar where they're doing that? Oh, Milton. Yeah. That's... Oh, is that where the hotel is? That's where the, that's where the brewery is. The brewery is in Milton. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, it's a whole new, it's a whole new ball game food that, food ways that way. There we go. Oh, Rehoboth. Yeah, I thought it was in Rehoboth. So then, last but not least, we'll be talking about higher end concepts and kind of what's, what, where, you know, now that food is really becoming entertainment and culture uh, in a major league way in restaurants, what does that uh, mean for breweries? What kind of opportunities are there? Uh, Mally just put down here Magnolia and Dogpatch Barbecue, two, two rather higher end joints, and not higher end in terms of being overly fancy, but certainly striving to make the food be equally as excellent as the, the beer. Yeah. And, um, and definitely a yeah. higher. Um, Check. Yes. Yeah, that's Magnolia in San Francisco. Yeah. I, I, as you've seen, I did some photo shoots in that movie down there that's with this week, um, the, the film that we have for this week's class. And um, every time I went in there, I was by myself, and I had like one beer and some food items, and I spent like forty bucks. So, so their average ticket price is quite high, and they definitely are packed all the time. And the barbecue is going to be in the same place. It's going to average like $40 a head for, for your barbecue dinner and a beer or two. So that's a little more than what it's we kind see. kind of a sign of the times that you've yeah. seen beer just kind of penetrate into different categories in the restaurant world in general. So it makes sense to me that there's people that have tried to do tablecloth brew pub before and and not done very well. I, I was there. Um, <laughs> it's challenging. Every chef brew pub. Yeah, there's a, there's for a lot of for your average Joe there's kind of a disconnect there. And um, and then for your average beer drinker there might be a price connect disconnect there too. So um, but things are changing. Things are progressing and people are uh, making all different types of things work at different levels. So we'll see. Oh, here we go. We're talking, going to talk a little bit about Ecliptic. Um, you all saw the film on uh, when John Harris was just building out that space. A lot of the video there was of the empty warehouse, and now it's open. And um, Charlie's actually done some brewing guest appearances there. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it that. <laughs> but not cooking. Cleaning, sweeping. Now, John, John actually was my first boss here in Oregon 20 years ago, and so still a good friend. And when he... And then I'm I'm kind of uh, a free agent right now. I'm just hanging out, doing stuff like this. And here's my buddy who's working his tail off to open a brewery. I just started hanging out and spending a lot of time there. So I'm pretty familiar with what they're up to. And I'm, it's very impressive uh, the quickly they've kind of got things rolling and working really well. So John, uh, John's. Uh, like me, John has always we've always kind of looked at the the beer landscape and wondering when more people are going to kind of put more effort into trying to be, uh, to, to approach food a little bit more uh, aggressively. And here in Portland, you know, the last five or ten years, it's just been this massive explosion of killer food at all different price points and levels. And it just makes sense to us that the beer should, the food should follow suit with that in a brew pub. Um, just laid out a line in the sand for himself that he, that he wants to be that guy. Um, he, uh, as I said, says here, he tried Eater. If you're familiar with Eater website, uh, he wants to be on their Eater 100 list, which is 100 best restaurants in town for that year. Um, the Eater so, has been kind of responded nicely and has put him on the hot bars list, uh, which is um, a lot of times. Uh, you know, when you're bootstrapping a brewery. You, you'll bootstrap the kitchen too, and just that's part of the kind of burgers and fries equipment. Is it? If, as anybody's ever been to like, eat fast food knows, it's not it's not rocket science, and uh, you don't calling the person who runs it a chef is stretch too. Um, John hired a chef from a good restaurant, uh, been a sous chef at, at a good Italian restaurant, uh, to run his food program. So they really hit their ground running with a rather extensive menu, and. Um, because it's a big place, I, I think in particular, uh, they were a little worried about the price uh, game and having um, 
you know, $15 to $20 entrees being their stock and trade when you have 130 seats. And that, I mean, that, that would be the same for any restaurant. There are not a lot of restaurants in 100 plus seats that have, that are, that are in that price point. Um, so what they chose to do is to do a variety of burgers that are very high end, hand formed, uh, excellent quality product. There's lamb, there's a beautiful veggie veggie burger of their own it's creation, two, two of them. And uh, so they have half a dozen burgers, but then they have they have a bunch of veg sides and a bunch of appetizers, which are all very high quality. And then they have a seasonal menu, which can change every six times a year, which is that fifteen to twenty dollar lamp shank and uh, uh, higher end uh, entree, still pretty reasonably priced. It's a neat model, really. Um, as uh, as it says here, though, uh, I think they are hoping for the seasonal thing to be a bigger piece of it and um, it hasn't been yet and it's really hard to judge any of these concepts in a you know eight weeks on the ground but um, I think that it's a work it shows that it's a work in progress and uh, that uh, the stock and trade is still kind of uh, that price point that 10 11 12 dollar price point uh, with the beer that's what people expect and I think John's hoping that this will uh, be something that they'll prove themselves and people will embrace a little bit more. But uh, in spite of the effort and the focus and all that, it still is kind of a, it still is that world. It's still that world. So. Well, it is, I mean, you could say the location is necessarily the most high-end location. That's true. There's all kinds of things that go into it. So uh, it's on a, it's in a kind of a funky neighborhood and it's, um, there aren't a lot of fine dining avenues and, and uh, or places in that street. Yeah, and, uh, not like Magnolia. Right, it's not know, like being downtown San Francisco. Yeah, there isn't much, and people spend a lot more money on it right. and are used to it. Or the publican in Chicago, which is oysters mm -hmm. and country ham and fast beer. Yeah. So, um, all good things to consider, though, and I think the biggest takeaway for me is you have to have a really good strategy, but it's a great time to be creative with that strategy, too. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think most people are expecting you to, you know, there's going to be a certain point where someone's going to open a brewery with, with regular beers and a bunch of burgers and fries and people are just going to yawn. And so that's not good either. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now we're, I get to talk yeah, more. What's <laughs> your philosophy? Great, great. Instead well, of we've philosophy. pretty much covered all of this. The burgers, burgers, are, burgers are not to burgers, I think, is a big one. Um, we chose not to use do burgers and not have a fryer. We chose to do pizza and kind of come from a uh, kind of pizza freak from back east. And uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I, so, but I had to be convinced into doing pizzas, and we we focused on doing uh, the best pizza we could. But pizza is one of those that's super cool because pizza is a really unique food and a, a proposition you know it's one of the few things that people share kind of by nature um, and it's uh, you can have as much or as little as you want you can take it away for later and uh, you can have it for breakfast and people one of the few meals that people are uh, accustomed to having not really being care if they have it more than once a week uh, they have it for lunch they have it for dinner and last but not least it's um it's probably the best food cost item uh, in the entire restaurant world in terms of the cost of ingredients. Heart, and, it's, and you don't have to be a chef. So those are all kind of fun. The, um, you know, okay. Oh, so, okay, so Robinson's got uh, an evolution. Let's, let's back up for that. Evolution of pub food to dishes designed to be shared from concept. Dishes with sharing at the center. That's, I think, a bigger, you know, small plates and sharing is kind of... Uh, uh, it has to do with the uh, casualization of uh, restaurant world and, you know, people aren't wearing suits and ties as much as they used to. <laughs> people are more cool about sharing stuff than they used to be, you know, and uh, it's, all, it's all a wonderful thing that way. And I think it, pay, it plays in the hand of beer in a lot of ways because beer is very casual by nature. Mm -hmm. And so food's more casual, perfect. Um, it kind of all works together. Uh, one thing I wrote here on this slide, you guys, is uh, fine dining conflict with beer. You know, I talked a little bit about price point. I think that's probably the 
thing. Uh, and then there's just kind of the, the stereotypes and the preconceptions about it. Um, but more importantly, I think from the, the concept side is, uh, for most of us, you spend all that money on equipment, you, you want to sell some beer. Uh, breweries are expensive. And if you're kind of doing it and saying, I want to be really elite, you can have a hard time you know, lining that up with the debt or whatever it is that you did to get that. I mean, breweries are meant, there's very few breweries that really can, uh, can get away with just being super exclusive. Um, yeah, I was going to you know, chime in on that. Uh, I was involved with, I was the brewery consultant for the Hops Brewery in Arizona in the early 90s, and um, they took on really high-end food. We had a full production facility, but they also had an extensive cocktail and fancy champagnes and wines. And a lot of people came in there, you know, with that high-end menu and ordered cocktails and champagne and wine instead of beer and that you know, that doesn't help pay off the, the brewery and that business ended up um, I, I worked there for a year as their consultant and trained someone and left but that business ended up disappearing because they really didn't have that formula balanced to sell enough beer with that kind of food that they had so there are those I think today it's a little different there's some opportunities but you know people weren't ready for that and they may not be ready for for that in certain parts of the world right now. Yeah, I think there's a there's a there's a hard uh, cold numbers game there too. Is um, that f finer dining typically is smaller places because a smaller audience, it's fewer turns. It's kind of it's gonna it's gonna mean you're gonna sell less beer, and no matter how fine the food is, the beer is gonna be the better money maker. Mm -hmm. um, so add it all up and it just becomes there's some there's some roadblocks to success there it doesn't mean anybody you can't do it and, and quite frankly I think that good product wins more often now than ever before so I'll keep coming back to it if you do whatever you do if you do it really well your odds of success are high uh, all of us talking aside so um, yeah the, the, the specialization the, to me the exciting part is specialization not about price but like, who's going to open up the, the greatest barbecue brew pub, right? We focused, we had 10 men um, five of which were pizza. And we got written up for our pizza because it was really good. And that, that ended up being, we ended up selling more pizza than beer uh, on an average day at the pub. Um, and that didn't start that way at all. And it really kind of made it be a better destination. The last piece here is food needs to align with your beverage style. I think that's um, that's just about kind of concept unity. So your concept has to be well thought out and fleshed out, and just you know, selling having uh, barrel aged beers and all you're serving them with them is burgers seems wrong, you know. And uh, uh, there's ways to kind of address that by diversifying your menu for sure. Um, and you know, Russian River is a great example. It's one of the most pop, uh, most profitable groups in the country, and it's pizzas. Um, so they're, if anything, they're kind of bucking that trend. But their pizzas, I mean, their beers go great. The 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 reserve beers might, you might kind of say, wait a minute, here. But you know, fighting with a pizza sounds pretty good to me too. So <laughs> there's no, once again, there's no hard and fast answers that way. Our next one. And all this kind of goes through the filter of where you're at. And we've talked about this before, that we're here in Portland, which has this moving food scene and tons of breweries. We have our reality. Um, but uh, if I go into some place that's, uh, that's uh, where I'm breaking new ground, they might not even really have a frame of reference. I mean, it's all about fitting your audience. And uh, so don't take this as kind of like any kind of hard and fast rules. I'm opening up the first brew pub in, um, in a town in Oklahoma that where they kind of need to I need to walk them into this. I'm going to have way different priorities than I would uh, if I wanted to open up a brewery in Southeast Portland, mm -hmm. San Francisco, or San Francisco, Chicago. or Chicago, or New York, uh, or Philly, or whatever. So soon to be Asheville, <laughs> right? <laughs> Great in places. So. Kind of, this is our last slide, I think, that 
we're um, talk, thinking about food, you know, putting a, if, if you're going to go in this direction, then think carefully about it and the location that you're in. Um, you know, in particular, we're talking about, is this a core competency for you, food, or is someone on your team going to have the capability to handle the food side? Um, as you can see with John Harris, he hired GM, you know, and same with Christian at Hopworks, you know, to hire a GM and have a person just, you're, you're all about food, that's your world, you take care of that for us. That's one way to do it, but, you know, again, that's, that's going to cost a fair amount of money to get a good GM, more than a brewmaster. Sometimes, yeah, You know, to get sure. a really good food person, it's going to be like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year salary. Or, or, you know, it, it, what you'll see a lot, too, is that you, know, you have a group of guys or guys and girls to start a group. One of them says, I'll do the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And that can work out sometimes. It can also be, it's a very specialized line of work. Mm -hmm. And uh, like any job, you're, you kind of go after it with no experience at your own peril. And uh, I've seen probably more guys kind of crap out of that. It's like the three guys start the brewery. One guy makes beer. The other does sales. The other one owns the pub. It's always, always, it's always the restaurant guy that's out first. <laughs> well, it's a burnout job too. <laughs> it's hard, and then you know, there's a there's a bunch of other things that make it harder too. That you know, breweries are typically 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. affairs as much for as long as they can be, and um, that doesn't work in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You end up with this kind of day shift, night shift mentality. You have um, you have a lot of uh, potential issues in terms of how you treat those employees. Um, you know, you have people on tips, people not on tips. There's a bunch of things that you end up having to have, you know, become these complexities of management that uh, certainly uh, not suggesting that a brew pub is an easy way to make money. It's a lot, you're adding something more complicated on other always already complicated endeavor making good beer every day. But, um, you know, I, in, in terms of the competency, it is one of those things I will say that is a very well-worn world and is hireable. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even definitely more so than brewing. And uh, uh, is it's something that you can certainly add on if you're a capable person who understands how to kind of keep things going. Uh, so I, I, for a lot of you, I know that a lot of you have kind of uh, – that we've talked past at least uh, are starting kind of small and looking at a lot of you looking at smaller concepts that way kind of how do I graduate from into or out of nano brewing and I'm sure this this kind of is a little bit down the road um, but having said that I think that it's also a great avenue because uh, it just gives you it diversifies what you're doing and it, it gives uh, people uh, an extra reason to come and see you get to know you and it's actually a way to grow your brand identity quicker and for me that was very important. I, our math too was when we started we just didn't realize we, we said you know we can do a production brewery that's what we know how to do but it's going to be a while before it gets up to where we can pay ourselves and it's going to sound silly but opening up a bar we're like you know at the very least if I'm not making, if I'm not making money over here I'm going to go 10 bar and I, can, tips. and I can get tips and feed my family, and it, it's not a bad backup. Um, probably the, the most important piece of whether it's a restaurant or not is being able to see, have your own bar and see people across it. And to have that connection with them, it's super important. To, it's just a, a wonderful way to build brand equity. And it's also that way of instant, instant feedback. So restaurant or not, People in your own place, it's, I, I can't stress it enough, is absolutely the best way to spend your time. You're trying to get people to know your product and to, um, to get to know your business. There's really no, uh, no substitute for it. Would you agree? I agree. And I think one did thing you, we, Did you ever attend bar? No, but that's going to be my, my retirement job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get out of the university and be a bartender. A I, never, I, I, did, I actually was more likely to do dishes in a kitchen than 10 miles. I've done them all because I lived in a ski town for too many years. There's not a lot of choices. Uh, first six months, I would show up on Friday nights and watch them cook and do dishes. Yeah. Because that out. was the – we had four employees and we 
but they needed the help. So. It's glamorous stuff. Oh yeah. I think we should mention, you know, we've been talking about beer, but you know, we we haven't really seen too much activity with people who are cideries opening a business. Although I, I hear that the guy from San Honoré is going to open a cider oh, business, nice. a cider bar with food. And then again, you know, <coughs> the whole spirits. You know, I had a friend. She just opened a place recently, and she's making her own vermouths, which are not really a still. You know, you're using somebody else's distilled stuff, and she's doing pairing that with food. But that's very rare. But, so that's an opportunity. Yeah, that's interesting. I like you that. Know, idea. To have the other kind of spirits, since we have other people in the class with interests in cider or distilled spirits, that there's there's opportunities out there. I'll be interested to see what happens in some of these markets where this activity and spirits and cider. Yeah, I think it, the, the the marketing piece of it certainly holds true. Mm -hmm. They're getting people that kind of that captive audience of them in your house would be huge. Yeah. That's all I know. You have a business idea <laughs> kind of forming here. No, I'm not going to see how the, the cider place does. They're you know they're going with yeah. sort of French approach, and they'll have a lot of imported ciders and domestic. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think there's a that's only easier. A time. Spirits can be tricky for pairing. Sure. So desserts. You don't even really see a lot of a lot of spirits companies that have a bar. Yeah. It's a tasting room, and they're just getting tastes away. Oh, here's now. Well, let's open it up okay. for questions. Since yeah. Tom's asking about minutes. total square foot and how much did you dedicate? Well, when we started, it was about 1,600 square feet pub, and the rest of 5,000 square feet, so 3,400 square feet production. And the the pub part actually kind of um, expanded into. We ended up sharing part of the 5,000 square feet. We would actually have the driveway be filled with tables on the weekend, and then we clear them out and use that for trucking product back and forth. Uh, and then when we expanded, we expanded with more pubs. So now now it's probably 60-40 production versus pub. Uh, we had only really had technically 49 seats when we opened in the pub. And now, now out there there's, I want to say, 150. Yeah, it's big. Any yeah. other questions? Anyone else is going to have a passion? There you go. That's a question. Well, there's not a. In some places you're not going to have a big choice. Yeah, some places sometimes there's not a lot of choice. Um, Cisco. You're choosing food distributors and suppliers. It's really no different than if you're opening a restaurant. Everybody has different. There's different strategies. Um, Typically, you don't want to be buying from a lot of different people because it's a logistical nightmare. Um, you want to be able to have three or four tops that you can supply that can you can that can provide for you. Uh, some people feel that you should you should tie your your let's say you're trying to choose between and you don't have to but let's say you're trying to choose between a, two or three of the big food suppliers for the majority of what you're doing. Some people say, well, every six months I'm going to review this, or I'm going to, I'm going to get better prices by being a free agent and looking around. Um, a lot of times, though, that just leads to logistical problems, too, and then you, you've created a lack of loyalty in your relationships with them, um, in my opinion, at least. But, uh, you know, they're big businesses, and you're small. It can be difficult. Uh, I've known plenty of places that have opened up without using them at all, and prefer to go to cash and carry or some other cheap place to get stuff, but that's that's almost like a political statement because <laughs> yeah. those guys aren't any different. It's all just kind of industrial stuff. And then you know, uh, the, the, it's it's really no different than when the restaurant world is that you know you can you can you can have 15 food suppliers and and do all that, but it's not really it's going to be hard for that to translate into the restaurant experience particularly kind of at the burger level. Uh, uh, but if you're but, like Christian at right. Hopper, which has got a big organic focus, so they are going to use a flyer that carries a lot more Correct. organic food. And then if you want some high-end items, to, you might have to end up using the people that supply fancy cheeses and charcuterie and things like that. Sure. In addition to like the mainstream, there's really only three or four mainstream food <laughs> distributors every place in the U.S. You know, you have the Cisco's, the um, yeah, 
it's getting easier to use those guys to get something that's that's better than average, but very rarely do they have anything that you won't see at five other places down the street. So it's hard to differentiate by if you rely on those guys. Um, having said that, the biggest issue that I've ever seen is when people overdo it and they got a different guy for every vegetable and this and that, and it just becomes a cluster. And it's not really helping um, at the end of the day. There's supplies are there's always going to be some compromises in getting supplies because you you benefit from developing a relationship. And uh, sometimes it might not be the guy you want for everything, but you know, you, you're busy trying to create and take care of people. If you're busy kind of spending all your time getting frustrated with suppliers, typically it's kind of a, it's an energy loss. So that's my opinion at least. Did you buy a lot of local stuff at Double Mount? Like yeah, we, well that we, that's the we did that kind of as a way whenever possible, really, because people they responded to it. Yeah. So you know, then you might you have to use a different distributor to get local produce. You know, every situation is different. We were out in we were an hour out of Portland, so we had limited choices that way, and so a lot of our choices were based on who did a good job of getting it there. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were based on personal relationships. You need the FSA had a sales guy we liked better than Cisco did, mm -hmm. and he he had been there twenty years, and Cisco had a new person every six months. So it's all that calculus of you know, that, that stuff. I think that for for me, uh, it was important to be true to, the, more true to the mission. Um, and the mission was to provide good food that was, uh, that was uh, really good quality without being, without breaking anybody's bank. We wanted to be affordable too. That, making pizza had a lot to do with that. And we ended up not really kind of expanding the menu out, out of that because Pizza was really easy to figure out. You could buy the best flour and the best tomatoes, and it would still be a reasonably priced, you know, you can get out of there for under 10 bucks of, of your entree. Um, that was pretty key for me at the time. Uh, still, you know, that stuff, the values is important. It's really nice to be able to offer someone, have a really good product that's also a good value. That's compelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's where I came down with it. But I could just as easily see somebody who starts a small brewery that says, I'm going to get everything from my neighbors. I'm going to go to local board and do all that. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of to be said for that. So once again, whatever you do, do it well, and most likely you'll have an audience. One thing I should mention about food distributors is they're all going to give you probably different financial terms, and that is important. Yes. Um, if you're new, they're going to make you pay for a lot of stuff. Like as soon as it's delivered, you're paying. But a lot of them end up being, um, depending on who you're dealing with, they could be more generous with their terms so that you have, uh, they're, they're faster to get to you, get you to a point where you might be 30 days out before you have to pay. But initially, they're all going to be pretty harsh on new, new businesses in terms of getting you to pay right away as soon as the food is, arrives. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that can be really important when you're the first six months or year in particular, when you're strapped for cash and every dime is getting counted. Getting those relationships can really be valuable. Mm -hmm. You're typically not going to get terms from someone that shows up at your door with a, with a case of lettuce <laughs> that they grow in their backyard or a bunch of mushrooms that they pick. They kind of need to get paid cash. And mm -hmm. A lot of the fancier guys will have, have come on to net 10, stuff like that, because they end up... Uh, uh, if you're a cheese and, and, and charcuterie distributor, you probably um, uh, you're specialized yourself, and you don't really have this giant network to absorb a bunch of losses. And you're dealing with a lot of places, and restaurants close a lot. So mm -hmm. there's a reason why most of these guys don't do terms, is because if they did terms for everybody, they'd be out of business too. So but lots to learn there, but it's, it's also not that complicated. The other thing is um, companies like Cisco for their clients have a, um, they do workshops where you can come in and they'll do menu consulting and they'll also show you uh, in terms of what you're selling, what are the things that are making the best money, 
and um, they have a whole like menu analysis department that's, yes. I don't know if you ever went through it, but it's, it's a very great service for their clients. They don't charge you and you can go in. Hugely valuable piece of infrastructure to bring into your company. Just one of the good reasons to use those guys is to piggyback on their software that they can, they can show you. And you can use that for the rest of your restaurant. Let's say 20% of your goods are coming from a major supplier using their software. For, they'll, they'll let you use it for everything. That's kind of cool. And the same stuff would cost you, a, a, you know, a couple thousand bucks to sell. And uh, so, good point. Any other questions? You guys are getting hungry just talking about food. So, I have a question for you guys. Is there anybody there that is kind of uh, thinking in these terms? Yeah, Cisco will print menus for you. That's oh, they will. Too. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Who want, who's the, who's gonna do who's thinking food already? Anybody? Food council. Me. Limited food. I think there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah, I think uh, it's an endless debate. That's a very good point. I think the food trucks thing is you know for it's the same thing as it is for some restaurateurs. It's like you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go work this thing out in a food truck. It'll be low reward but low risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I get a groundswell support, then that'll lead to a restaurant. Or at the very least, I'll have learned my trade, or uh, kind of focused and you know fine tune what I'm doing. So, uh, low, uh, a lot of risk. I think it's kind of neat. It is neat. If you're in a place where they're you know liberal with food carts. They can pull from places. Some states have been a little more hardcore about that. Yeah, I think that the the food cart thing is is definitely uh, fun. I would, I know that if I was to do it, that I would be pretty focused on making sure that they were there and that it provided some level of predictability for the people that wanted to come. That the unpredictability thing will kick your ass if you have full time employees that are standing around and people aren't there because the guy the food truck didn't show up. Yeah. That's, I mean, if, if the food guy, food truck guy decides not to go to work that day, he's really only hurting himself. Mm -hmm. um, but if he's hurting you and your payroll, then that's kind of uncool. Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, unless there's some kind of contract in place, which I don't even know how you would enforce, you know, it's kind of, it's one of those, one of those variables. Um, so John wants to have a <laughs> barbecue offering. That's it. It's a good idea. I mean, I think barbecue is great, just like pizza. Yeah. I, I love barbecue with beer. It's, you know, Once again, though, those guys, them. I mean, Franklin Barbecue, they go home at 2. So with barbecue until they run out, that might not that might not quite work with the other pieces of running a successful bar that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, um, but, you know, it's a, it's, a wild, it's, a, it's a wonderful world of that stuff out there right now. It's fun. I mean, there's... There's all kinds of new models to be figured out that way. And, and Tom's saying, you know, having local food places deliver. That's what um, yeah. Bailey's does. They have menus in the bar. You can call in your order. Right, and, and they, have, so they have their burrito joint across the street, too, Perfect. and they'll deliver it to you. The closer the local <coughs> food places, the better. Yeah. And like a, so, tor like a Toronado, I mean, there's a t t tamale lady. Oh, that's you awesome. You know about that? No. Yeah, they, they, and they tweet out about it. That's and you well, can make it fun. fun. Yeah. No, I think that there's a lot of creativity. And what we we're talking about is kind of dominant paradigm with that, that stuff, but there's all kinds of cool ways to go about it. Well, great. Well, lots of great ideas. I hope you guys have fun with it, and I've enjoyed having everybody in class. And thanks, Charlie, sure. for coming again. Thank you. He's been a regular on many of our live sessions, and we're, you can tell we're, all, we're very excited about food. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to go try another new restaurant tonight. So. Um, you know, we live in a good town. But thank you, everybody. And, you know, again, if you need any help with your business plans, please um, send them in or email me, and we'll do what we can to help you. Great. Thanks, Enjoyed guys. Enjoyed having you all. You guys are all the regulars. Fun to do. Take care.